It's Friday, and it's another edition of the Zogby Report, Real and Unscripted. The United State of Democracy is what we will be referring to the Zogby Report from here on in, because basically that's what we're talking about uh, every week. And so uh, I'm John, and hello, Jeremy. How are you? Hey, Dad, I'm, I'm doing fine. I'm just wondering... Where do we begin uh, this week? That, what are we going to talk about? That that's uh, that's always a good question. Just, this just came to me, and, and I want to keep it as you do, real and unscripted. But yeah. just so many things that are out there. But this is what I want to focus on now: numbers. So the just reported the um, the GDP grew or is growing at an annual rate of 6.7%. That's quite good. It's very high. Unemployment is under 4%. It's holding steady 3.9%. Second or third month in a row that it's been under 4%. Wages have climbed, and those who are working are making more money. There are more people out there with a raised minimum wage and more incentives to to be at work um, than ever before. So that is all on one hand. On the other hand, why aren't we happy? The man in charge, Joe Biden, has a job performance rating of 40%. Uh, In addition to that, um, 74% feel that things in the country are headed in the wrong direction. Uh, and six out of 10 Republicans, this is a brand new poll that just came out in the last couple of hours, six in 10 Republicans say that they will not vote for any candidate who says that Joe Biden won the 2020 election. So on one hand, we've got the barometric readings that we've always used, whether they're perfect or imperfect is immaterial. They're the ones we always use, and the indicators are good. On the other hand, we're seeing some of the uh, most dismal feelings and evaluations that, uh, that, that we've ever seen. Help me out here. I'll, I'll have some comments about it. I'll have a lot of comments about it, but why aren't we happy? Well, um the reality is, so so you're talking about data, you're talking about some of these statistics like GDP, uh, un, unemployment, and then the fact that the minimum wage has been up. But of course, obviously, the counter to that is seven, uh, 7% inflation. And by the way, that's a new calculation of inflation. If you were to go by an earlier one, say like late 80s, early 90s, it would probably be closer to 15% inflation. Um, The unemployment being at 4%, of course, we know that they don't count people who've given up work altogether. And and we have this situation where a lot of people are not filling the jobs. There there are record numbers of job openings, but um, people, a lot lot of adults are, are, are choosing to not go back to work because, I mean, let's face it, Uh, the benefits, the current unemployment benefits uh, pay about as much as the average job. So unemployment isn't capturing that. If you were to go by earlier modes of unemployment, some are suggesting that's above 15%. So um, it's really just all how you calculate the data. And of course, Mm -hmm. I would argue that not only this administration, not only the previous administration, not only even the previous, previous administration have an incentive to not show these things, to not show what the real unemployment rate is, to not show what the real inflation rate is. I mean, I, I, they're not accurate. I, I don't think they're actually capturing. So that's the thing is that they're, they're kind of more buttressing an optimistic outlook when the reality on the ground is, is that people are paying more for everyday staples, uh, if inflation in, is in uh, eroding uh, people's paychecks, and although minimum wage is up, 
the fact of the matter is, is wages in general, the, I guess you could say the, the average income is kind of stagnant at somewhere in the 1990 levels. Uh, and then to throw fuel on top of, you know, an already growing flame, you have a, a very, very um, tense political situation. We've had two elections, presidential elections in a row that were denied by the other side. Um, there are people who want to get into who was worse. If you want to rate it, if you want to index it, let, let's do this. Let's say on a scale of one to 10, you know, Republicans were 11.5 uh, regarding their reaction to Joe Biden and the Democrats and the, the, you know, the corporate media, the mainstream media were only a seven or an eight. The fact of the matter is public confidence has been undermined economically and it's been undermined politically and that's that's really the backdrop to to why it all doesn't add up all right um so is it joe biden's fault or is it because he happens to be the guy in the in the hot seat right now just like anybody is uh you know things go well when when um when uh the um uh, Navy SEALs found, captured, killed uh, Osama bin Laden. You saw Barack Obama's numbers go through the roof. He's mm -hmm. the guy at the top, right? He gets the credit and he gets the blame. Um, is, it, is it Joe Biden's fault or has he been held, uh, dealt a, a bad hand of cards here? Well, as you would say, it all, it's always the president's fault. It always falls on the president because they're in the spotlight. They're the person who's understood to be in charge. Um, but here's the reality. If, if I were to say, and, and by the way, I do believe in silver bullet issues. I do believe that when you look at a problem, there is one solution that can alleviate that problem. Now we're talking about the problem of public confidence in mm -hmm. the overall system. The real problem is, and I've, I've discovered this recently, only recently, that there, there was this thing known as the Fairness Act which was enacted um, by the FCC uh, following World War II that said it was the duty of public broadcast and, and, and networks that journalists, and of course, by extension, executives, basically the news would have to present multiple points of point of view, multiple mm -hmm. um, angles of, of, point of point of view for public discourse in the interest of, of the public. And under Reagan, the Fairness Act was thrown out. And what essentially happened was network news and, 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 um, and, and we could say mainstream media outlets are beholden to their shareholders. They're not beholden to the public. And so journalists fall in that and basically news is created and manufactured to to fit the interest of shareholders and not public discourse. And that I think is the immediate backdrop to what has happened to our news, why there isn't accountability, why there aren't multiple perspectives. It's driven really by corporate shareholders of these corporate mainstream media outlets. Well, let me it's, stop it's, you there for one second. Well, 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 well hold on. It, it's both on the left and it's, it's also Fox News. And when mm -hmm. you shut out public debate, and when you don't open the door, even if you think someone's lunatic, why don't you invite them on and let them show to the public why they're a lunatic instead of just name calling them and, and making them persona non grata so people only hear the attacks. Let the public think for themselves. If we live in a society where we fear the public's ability to decipher what is real and what isn't, when the job of the journalist is to pre present multiple viewpoints, well, then we have no faith in our society, and this is what we get. So, so we've had a breakdown of really all of our major institutions. We're not only talking political and governmental. We've talked about this uh, many, many times over the over the uh, couple of years now that we've been doing this. And in terms of the news media, I, I mean, I, I, I agree. Uh, I agree with what you said about the mainstream media. But what I also know is that the mainstream media is being watched 
by fewer people than ever before. There was a time when Walter Cronkite and uh, Huntley and Brinkley and, and uh, Howard K. Smith over at ABC, where they, they just dominated that 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, time frame where many, most uh, American homes uh, got their news from those uh, major sources. Now, you know, those numbers that tune in to NBC Nightly and CBS and, and ABC uh, are fewer and fewer. Okay, so we have cable news as well, but those numbers aren't very impressive. So to counter your argument, we have an unprecedented amount of social media, you know, the kind of the modern day version of the water cooler, which mainly is how people always got their news in the past. Yes, the networks and the local newspaper uh, were very important, but in the final analysis, when we polled people, where'd you get your news? I, from my colleagues at work and from friends and family. And now we have that uh, multiple, multiplication um, uh, uh, effect where people are on social media. And now it's, it can be rumors, it can be gossips, it can be fake stories, but at least people don't have that, uh, are, are not totally dependent you know, on those giant sources. So, I mean, how relevant uh, are the news media? the major, the mainstream uh, news media in our lives. You know, I recall, and I wrote about this in my first book, The Way Will Be, I called January 28th, 1998, the second declaration of independence. Um, I don't know if you know it, but that's when the Monica Lewinsky story broke. And that's when Tim Russert, uh, the king of NBC News, Sam Donaldson, the king of ABC News, both said, the president of the United States will be out of the Oval Office before the weekend is over. And that didn't happen. Americans declared their independence. They had their own sources of news and their own opinions. How, how important is the mainstream media? Are they really screwing up this, this country? Well, I mean, you, you, you make a great point. And so we have to include within mainstream and corporate media, we have to include big tech, we have to include the social media platforms because the social media platforms buttress the, the, the major networks. Without the social media platform, I, I think there's reason to believe that a lot of networks probably would have no, nosedived and would, would have completely gone under. But if you notice, social media is, it will, will by and large uh, flag independent news flag independent news that doesn't fit within the mainstream narrative and you know either shadow ban it or 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 erase it or dox it or you know whatever the the terms are and so they they kind of play off of each other you know what what is what is network news talking about well they're showing you you know what tweets are and and who who facebooked or who you know, who tweeted this and when you go on twitter and when you go on facebook uh, what are they sharing? Well, they're by and large sharing articles from the network. So they buttress each other. And so I would fit social media into the category of corporate and mainstream media. And it goes back to this point. They're segregating us. Segregation, you know, when we think of segregation, we think of skin color. The new segregation now is, is digital and it's about what you consume in your mind. And if it falls into are the they segregating us or are we? I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, you know, I, I, that's a very important question. Are, are we doing that to ourselves? We're following the algorithms. The algorithms are are segregating us. The algorithms are are saying uh, are blocking this person. Are are saying this person is is uh, violating uh, you know terms, uh, uh, violating our terms. Although clearly. Other people do it, and and they remain, you know, uh, uh, on social media. So I mean, it's being driven by the algorithms. It's it's it's, uh, and people are following as a result. And this is a danger w when we shut out free speech, when we shut out open speech. Even in the example of, oh well, what if the crazies take over? 
Well, then I, we have to say to ourselves, how much do we trust society to openly, openly discuss, um, uh, you know, the, the problems of the day among themselves? Because it's my perception, if, if, if we don't have a, a positive and negative loop of feedback or a loop of positive and negative feedback, how do we allow different parties to perfect their message and to get feedback? We won't. We're just going to be told this is the message of the day and anything else that doesn't fit the orthodoxy gets shut out. Okay, some people do get shut out on social media, to be sure, but by and large, um, they have fora. You know, they have their they have fora that reach millions of, of people. I mean, I can give you examples. I don't think there's any need to do that. But a fact of the matter is that in even in the process of being shut out, they, uh, as victims, let's say, are able then to reach, you know, millions, hundreds of thousands of, of people. So, uh, uh, it's almost irrelevant that when one or two doors close, because it seems like ten or eleven doors doors open to contrarian, you know, or iconoclastic, or even foul um, ideas. All right. So, how do we move forward? I, I mean, if you were advising Joe Biden, and I'm only saying this mm -hmm. because, again, he's the guy in charge, you know, and he's the guy who has a reasonable amount of, of power left. I mean, what do you say to him? How do we get out of this? How does he get out of this? But how do we get out of this? <laughs> well, I will start, you're right. I Actually, I think we start by how does he get out of this before how mm -hmm. do we get out of this? But I, I'm afraid to tell you that I kind of think he's screwed. And I think he's screwed because I think the Democrats are screwed. And, and why do I say that? I think the Democrats are screwed because I think they put all their eggs in, in the basket of, of the Davos crowd. I, I, I really truly believe, look, I'm not saying the Republicans are the savior. I'm just saying that the Democrats have made it very easy for the Republicans to, to re-strategize, to say, hold on, what's our new approach here? Because we messed this one up. And of course, whatever their new approach was, was successful in Virginia and it was almost successful in New Jersey, and that momentum is caring. But the Democrats are are really stuck to as as basically being the party of of the Davos crowd. And what do I mean by that? I mean that they they are the party of the elite ideas. And right now, given what's going on on the ground, especially things like inflation, people aren't thinking about you know what what the the Davos crowd are are talking about. Not as much at least not enough to get, you know, a, a simple majority or, or, or a strong majority. I, I don't think you're going to get that. I, I think they're losing touch with what's going on the ground. So the only thing that I think Joe Biden can do is to, to look at the success as to where the Republicans are, are gaining ground and how they're gaining ground and, and apply a similar strategy of, of, you know, how, how do we reconnect with the people? How do we reinvigorate not only our base, but how do we reach over to the independents and and um, connect with their with their immediate needs? Because I don't think they're connecting with the immediate needs of the voters. What are those needs? I mean, what what do they re need to reconnect to? I mean, you you do focus groups, right? You sure. do survey. Yeah. What well, what what's being missed? Well, I, th I think I think the key right here is independence. And yeah, what what I mean, I think that's strategy. I think step number one is what do independents think by and large? Are are independents more or less thinking like Republicans, or are the, is there still a way to pull the the independents back to our base? We, we they're going to have to throw out what what the Democrats are going to have to put aside what they've tried over last year, because it clearly didn't work. Off the top of my head, I, I don't know, but I, I think I think a lot of focus groups targeting independents and in swing states and seeing what the independents believe and feel and and you know maybe maybe tapping into more populist tendencies 
that would be on the the the, the democratic side of of um, policy mm -hmm. and and politics. That's an immediate thought. But isn't that Bernie and AOC? Yeah, and and um, pr probably more so Bernie. Um, but I see where you're going with that. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Okay. So, um, f first of all, when we talk, first of all, I think that this is not intractable, but in the short term, um, I think both parties actually are in serious trouble. And in, a, in, in that sense, no matter who wins in November, it's going to have a very difficult time governing just as, Anybody who's been elected in the, in, in the last couple of decades has had a very difficult time governing. We talk about independence. Um, we need to remember this is not a united group. Uh, for a while, independence last decade <clears throat> included about almost 50 percent of, of them were uh, Republicans who were disenchanted with George W. Bush going to war big budgets, uh, the, the uh, um, Patriot Act, uh, and that sort of thing. Now there's disappointment on the Democratic side, and it includes a lot of young people who are saying, I'm going to register to vote. I want change. I lean Democrat. I may even lean towards Bernie, but I don't want to be a Democrat. I don't want to be a member of a hierarchical party. And so in order to understand independence, we're going to have to parse them and target different uh, groups of, of independents, those that, that are likely to even want to listen to some things that I have to say. I, th I think the, the understanding of who these independents are is, uh, you know, is, is certainly a, a major task. Um, I think by and large, and we've talked about this many, many times, we, we, almost have to get back to a pledge um, by both political parties and by independents as well, maybe as a price for registering to vote, that whoever wins the election wins the election, and I accept the results. I mean, we had a situation, we're in the 22nd Congressional District here, which was a tie, and a tie for actually a long, long time. And a horrible, stupid mistakes that were made by at least a couple of the counties uh, in this eight county district. And yet, when one person was finally de declared the winner, the other person stepped down and conceded. Um, that's got to be a, a that that's got to be a principal component of this before we can move forward. Whoever is elected president of the United States gets to push through a program uh, with some compromises so that we can move forward. And if we don't like that program, then you throw the bum out, as opposed uh -huh. to declaring almost on day one, we're going to fight everything. Hmm. We're going to fight everything. Um, and that's how this has been on being bipartisan here now. So, uh, well, well, then let me ask you. Um, I mean, what what does what do the Democrats and what does Joe Biden do after having spent a year focusing on Build Back Better, which it it just doesn't seem like it's going to go anywhere, and 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 focusing on um, uh, the voter suppression and and the voting the 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 voting rights uh, legislation. In the new year, what's the message? What do they pivot to, or do they not pivot? They pivot to their successes. I think you saw that last week with the news conference. Yes, there was a lot of talk. It was long. Uh, yes, some of the answers needed to be explained. Too much focus on the process. I think the president came out um, and said, you know, instead of focusing on what I haven't accomplished, let's take a look at what I have accomplished in terms of the infrastructure bill, in terms of the uh, the rescue uh, package. So there, a lot of money spent, a lot of people's lives are going to change because of improved um, uh, 
a, a bandwidth, improved uh, highways and bridges, people going back to work, local districts changing, schools being built, and so on. Um, he secondly needs to break up the Build Back Better, and he had as much as admitted that. So go after those pieces that are more popular and that are more likely to get the 50 votes or even 52 or 53 votes that he needs to get some of those things passed. I think that's an important first step. I think a very important um, uh, second step is something that he's being criticized for, but that I think actually works for him. And that is let Joe be Joe. Um, he talks off the cuff. Um, he steps in it from time to time. He called, uh, you know, a, a, a newsman who's been hounding him. Uh, and I quote, only a stupid son of a bitch. But that's very appealing to some voters. There's something, uh, hey, we, we live in Utica, right? I mean, that's, uh, that's sort of how each of us in our different generations grew up. And I think a lot of Americans did. Um, that's Joe. Joe Biden, I think, is at his best, not when he's packaged and is made to appear as something that he is not. I think you get what you get with, with Joe Biden, and, and that allows him to restore, I think, a special bond uh, that, that he has with people, somebody who both shoots from the hip and is an empathic sort of persona. That's it in a nutshell. But I mean, you know, obviously the criticism is, is people would say, well, that's not very presidential and coming off this crazy uh, previous president. Well, you know, um, but I don't want to go down that road. I, I'm just imagining what some people could say. But I mean, what you laid out as far as what he needs to do. I mean, now the obvious follow up question is really, in all honesty, how, how successful do you think that will be? A very good point. I look. I think there are elements of um, uh, energy legislation. All of this in the Build Back Better probably has a good chance of passing. Some negotiations from, you know, that need to be made with Joe Manchin in the uh, in the coal state of, of West Virginia. But you know, I think it's more than a half a loaf, you know, for Biden and the Democrats. I think the child tax credit. Um, is something that, uh, or, um, uh, yeah, child tax credit, something that, that can also pass because it's very popular as well. Uh, uh, more child care, absolutely essential if people who've left work are going to go back to work, whether they left work voluntarily or in, involuntarily. I think those are pieces um, that are more appealing to a large majority and then are not $2 trillion of new spending. They are tens of billions of new spending. That, that's the way I think you put some points on the board. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, I've heard this phrase before, don't talk in trillions, talk in, in, in thousands. And so and I who guess- Who said that? Uh, do we want to reveal who said that? Yeah, yeah I yeah. said that. Well, I mean, but then ultimately, then it becomes two billion thousand instead of two trillion, and and I it just it you know. But there's a return on the investment as well. So let me ask this: this is this is a very, very challenging question. So I, I'm alarming you that Boris Johnson just scrapped a lot of mandates in the UK: yes. vaccine mandates, vaccine passports. Oh, wow. Of course, you know he's been living it up, partying. Um, yeah. among, among his ilk. And the rules, of course, don't have to apply to Bojo, but they have to apply to everybody else. And finally, that blowback has come to fruition. And, uh, you know, typical uh, you know, uh, reaction, well, you know, let's scrap the whole thing and then maybe everybody will forget about it. We could be nearing a point in this country where enough people are going to say enough is enough. Um, what does Joe Biden do? Does he still push forward with his, uh, his executive order mandates, which we have to be very clear, uh, legally only fall under, you know, the staff that falls under the executive branch and does not apply to 
all citizens unless they actually try to pass legislation to do that. But what does Joe Biden do in light of what happened in the UK? And considering oftentimes what goes on in, in the UK is, is there are very similar trends across, uh, going on across the Atlantic? Well, very sadly, because of time limits, we can't really give this today the, the attention it deserves, although we should, I'm sure COVID will be a, a, a topic for discussion. And I have a feeling that Boris Johnson may be a, a topic of further discussion in the future. Yeah. Um, right now, he, Joe Biden is facing the problem of um, being challenged, being challenged successfully in the courts when it comes to, um, you know, to, to these mandates. And it remains to be seen what next week is going to show regarding COVID and Omicron in particular, um, and the numbers of children that will be vaccine, uh, vaccinated. Uh, and so this is kind of a moving topic. Let's save it for, uh, let's save it for next week. Fair enough? Um, I think, yeah, I'll, I'll find a way to slip it in somehow. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure you will. And because I rudely interrupted you earlier, uh, you get to rudely interrupt me next week. Okay. okay. All, All right. right. Take care. Good, good talk. Yeah, take care. Have a good weekend.